Hello, everyone, and welcome to our premiere episode of Meet the Scientist. My name is Dr. Sharon Pepinella, and today I have the distinct pleasure of introducing you to Dr. Samir Baez, a scientist at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory who studies how diet can influence the immune system and contribute to disease. Welcome, Samir. Thank you so much for having me, Sharon. Thank you for being with us today. So uh, maybe you could start by telling our viewers a little bit more about yourself and your research. Um, great, so I'm Simir Beaz. I'm a scientist at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories. I um, started my lab here roughly over two years ago. Um, and let me share, should I share the... Summary? Sure. Okay, I'll share a, a journey slide for you. Um, so I, I was born in uh, Turkey in a small rural beautiful town by the Mediterranean called Samanda. Uh, I was uh, the youngest of a large family uh, with six sisters and a brother so I learned very early on how to troubleshoot because there was a lot of trouble <laughs> in our household and as the youngest person I actually Contrary to the common conception is uh, uh, that the youngest people are spoiled. I was mostly uh, figuring out how to troubleshoot the troubles of my older siblings who were in their <laughs> early teenage years. Anyway, so that uh, sparked my interest in science. I was always passionate about it, but I learned an important lesson starting, you know, like in my elementary school days, then um, that solidified in uh, high school is that the real success in life was going from one failure to another without losing enthusiasm. And this is a, an anonymous uh, quote. Many uh, people also realized that in the, uh, in the history and that became my uh, motto uh, early on. And so uh, I was passionate about science. So I pursued a, um, a, a degree in uh, molecular genetics in Turkey at Izmir Institute of Technology. I started doing research right the uh, first week of my freshman uh, year in college and I slept in the lab many times. This is a picture uh, when I was still young, uh, sleeping in the lab over a, a, a prominent research journal. Uh, anyway, so that uh, journey brought me to uh, Harvard Medical School in uh, 2010. And with all the ups and downs, uh, the take home message I will give from that era of my uh, life was I uh, developed five key principles uh, which helped me to become the scientist I am today is to uncover a problem, not become part of that problem or not dwell on that problem, but uncover the problem, then don't rush without rushing it, uh, using the critical thinking that the scientific methodology allows us to uh, pursue a solution for the problem with immense motivation, and most importantly, with being okay to fail. That's the most important virtue uh, that a scientist can have, is being okay to fail, because 99% of the things that we do in the scientific discovery process is failures and learning from failures. And without losing the motivation, you need to repeat that cycle. So that path, right after finishing my PhD at Harvard, brought me to Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. And here I'm highlighting some of the honors and uh, good things that happened to me, uh, which are great. But again, uh, the most important lesson I learned is uh, without getting sucked into the competitive mindset, uh, in the you know course of my uh, uh, career, which always uh, I was subject uh, to, uh, to focus on uh, my core passion, which was uh, making discoveries with impact. Uh, and um, this is to do at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Um, I established a good, passionate group of people, and together we are very passionate uh, to understand how uh, what we eat, how diet uh, can influence health and disease states. Very cool. And uh, some good mottos in there. I like it. Yes. So what, uh, what initially sparked your interest in pursuing this research that focuses on this interplay between diet and disease? Yeah, so that's basically the, uh, the overview of the main question that we ask in the lab. Um, the... Uh, uh, the original uh, reason that I started focusing on that wasn't actually that I was really curious 
about diet and food in general, but I was really curious about a concept called epigenetics, like how uh, different cells in your body that share the same genetic information, I mean, mostly there are some cells that can make differences in their genetic makeup, uh, such as immune cells, but all these cells share the same DNA, yet they have distinct phenotypic and functional features, and they regulate this uh, drastically. And so there are some um, um, knowledge that we accumulated thanks to uh, great discoveries that happened in molecular biology the past 50, 60 years, but there is a big gap in our understanding how environment shapes us. And diet is one of those uh, big contributing factors uh, to uh, the environmental modification of our, uh, our lives. And so I chose to focus on diet actually through some serendipitous uh, uh, observations early on, but then we built uh, a framework, a, a perspective in which we focus on how physiological changes that are in, induced by the diet can um, affect our health and disease states, and then zoom in into the most molecular uh, detailed uh, mechanisms. So these include how proteins interact with one another, how metabolites change in our body, and then my passion and love for epigenetic mechanisms here also play a, a, a big role in our uh, efforts to uh, uncover these things. And basically the end goal is we want to identify the real causal mechanisms uh, in which how when we eat something or how when we are exposed to an environmental perturbation, uh, it can uh, define our health state and it can the risk of diseases. Wow. Do you find that people are afraid to have dinner with you? Uh, no, because I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm a decent cook. So I like actually cooking a lot and feeding people. So uh, coming from Mediterranean, I uh, uh, am a... Um, an enthusiast in kebabs and uh, uh, mostly the stuff that you see on the left panel here um, you know not the hamburger or pizza uh, but some of the other things um, <laughs> yeah but uh, no I mean like uh, my point here is um, my research is not gonna tell you you should eat this versus that but my research is gonna tell you the mechanisms when you eat something uh, how does this uh, translated into a different information in your body. So what do you think your most surprising finding has been with your research? Yeah, so that's, uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't rank them, but uh, that's my favorite finding is the surprising finding. I don't uh, like when what I think uh, happens after I do an experiment. I like it a lot when uh, I have a hypothesis and I think something is going to happen based on my prior knowledge. And when that prior knowledge is uh, not true or not the way that I initially thought based on the result of that experiment, that's my best, you know, like that's, that's the best, you know, like satisfaction I get from science when I learned something new that I thought that, you know, it was otherwise. So that surprise is, is, is really important for me. And so I can, I can actually give you a, a little bit example here. So in our lab, we study different uh, contexts, uh, how uh, diet and nutrients affect um, uh, the uh, biology of different components of a tissue. And so in 2016, we published this uh, paper um, in understanding how does diet and obesity influence disease risk by altering stem cell biology. And in that study, um, I wasn't initially thinking that there will be such drastic effect of the fatty acids and the diet on stem cell biology, but it took me, you know, like few failed experiments until I realized that that was actually the big fish in the pond. And then, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, another good uh, um, uh, trait I would highlight uh, for a good scientist in my mind is to quickly learn from your failure and turn that failure into uh, a positive thing, into an opportunity. And so I seized that and then that surprising finding lead to that uh, really impactful discovery in the field. Very cool. So uh, do you have a recommendation for people who are looking to modify their diets to minimize the risk of certain cancers? Uh, 
Well, our studies highlighted that uh, longitudinal overconsumption of uh, high fat food may contribute to um, obesity and may contribute to um, cancer risk. But I cannot, as a scientist, uh, tell anyone that they shouldn't eat fat because you need fat also as part of your uh, metabolic requirements. Uh, so I will just give you a very boring answer that your grandma can give as well, uh, is that you need to have a balanced diet. You know, you need to eat fat, you need to eat carb, you need to eat fiber, you need to have uh, vitamins, most likely if you can from uh, uh, natural sources, not uh, the pills over the counter. Um, so for now, that's the, uh, that's the answer I can give you based on our scientific findings. But as we learn more about mechanisms, as we uncover more about how individual dietary components influence our cells and our tissues and overall our organisms, uh, then I think we can uh, give uh, better answers. But right now, uh, we are still learning and at, we are at its infancy. So what's your favorite part about doing research and what do you find to be also your biggest challenge? Um, well, my favorite part is this, uh, being able to uh, look at a problem at uh, its uh, broader scale and then zoom in into the most detailed molecular mechanism. And that's also the biggest challenge of the way of I do science, uh, because in science, you usually need to pick one thing and then focus on it and then go really deep. So I challenge myself by doing uh, this, you know, deep perspective, but by interrogating uh, uh, larger uh, aspects as well. So I will give you an example. Let's say you have a you have a, um, a camera or you have a um, you know binocular, and then you are uh, trying to find some information like really far away, but at the same time uh, trying to uh, get really in into the most molecular. Uh, most detailed uh, aspect. It's like taking a picture from the moon, but still seeing like all the high resolution aspects of uh, whatever you are uh, focusing on. So that's a very big, very challenging thing, but I love it because that keeps me excited and awake. And, uh, you know, every day uh, I come uh, with a motivation to find an answer within that challenging framework. So you're excited by those challenges. Exactly, I love them. Perfect. <laughs> I know it's kind of counterintuitive, right? Usually people don't like challenges, <laughs> but I think um, uh, there's, a, there's a lyric, right? Like what doesn't uh, kill you, make you stronger for younger generation, but also it's a truism, right? What doesn't kill you, make you stronger. So I love challenges and I learn from them and I grow. Uh, after I overcome each challenge. Excellent. So let's talk a little bit about your background as a student. So you mentioned you grew up in Turkey. What yes. kind of student were you, or science student in particular in, in Turkey? So I uh, grew up in a very small town. So a student in Samanda uh, who wants to be a scientist always uh, is an outcast because uh, that... Uh, it's a little bit a utopia, right? So like we didn't have the institutes that we have, you know, in Long Island. So when I was going to high school, I always wanted to go to a university and do research. But, you know, I had to like climb mountains, uh, not literally, but like there were so many obstacles in front of me. You cannot just go to, you know, like a university like Cold Spring Harbor and be like, hey, can I come and like do summer research with you? So it was very challenging, but that taught me how to be resilient, right? So uh, I had to push and fight for my dream. Um, there were people who supported me, but there were a lot of obstacles in front of me so that even the people who loved me and supported me were like, maybe you shouldn't push that hard. Maybe you should just let go. So I think the biggest thing I learned is not to lever uh, and not to ever let go and not ever lose my enthusiasm. So I can tell you that I was resilient, dedicated, definitely hardworking and a dreamer. I always followed, chased uh, my dreams. And you can see here, it was like, I think 4 a.m. in the morning, I was in the lab finishing an experiment and taking a nap because I had an exam 
uh, the next day. Uh, so uh, that definitely was a defining feature uh, of who I am as a scientist. And that led to the principles I highlighted here that, uh, you know, definitely there will be lots of problems in our lives. There will be lots of struggles that we will go through. But without rushing into anything, if we use the scientific methodology, which is the core of it to me is critical thinking, critically evaluating what the problem is, critically evaluating who you are, understanding your strengths and weaknesses, and then utilizing your strengths to fix your weaknesses or to solve the, the problem by addressing these weaknesses. And then this requires an immense motivation and also uh, the uh, acceptance of failure is gonna part of it. And because you fail, it doesn't mean that you're bad and, uh, or uh, uh, enough. The failure is the course to uncover yourself and to uncover a concept in science and to be successful. So that's how I was, and that's you know how I'm still continuing to be. It's not it's not over yet. This is a lifelong process for me. And it sounds like you you knew then at a pretty young age that you wanted to do something with science. Yes, I mean I loved science, and um, you know some of these uh, uh, current mechanistic questions that we are addressing also stem from some earlier uh, inspirations uh, that I got. Uh, without actually knowing that I was inspired by these things. Uh, like food is a very important part of a Southern Mediterranean uh, life. Uh, that's the biggest concern that my mom and dad had probably, uh, especially if uh, um, uh, they need to demonstrate uh, their skill set about their cuisine. Uh, so uh, right now, you know, I'm trying to implement some of these uh, uh, core concepts of uh, uh, Mediterranean uh, way of living life also in uh, my understand in my approach to understand some of the uh, scientific question we are addressing. So if you had to pick any other career path wh what do you think you would be? Um, uh, probably I will be a chef so I really like uh, cooking and growing things so I grow uh, here at Cold Spring Harbor we have a shared garden as, as you know I don't know if you have ever utilized it but I love it, so I can't wait to start gardening this uh, year again. Hopefully, it's not going to be affected by the COVID-19 situation. Uh, but yeah, I like gardening. I like uh, grilling. I like cooking. I like, uh, so I will probably, uh, if, if science doesn't work out, probably I'll be a chef somewhere <laughs> around here so you can come by and enjoy uh, some good meal. Excellent. I I'm in. Yes. And I think uh, science and cooking really go hand in hand, so that yes. works out well. Um, so what do you feel is the most important trait for an aspiring scientist? I think I, would, I gave some examples early on, but I think I would rank being okay with failure, but not being okay failure to be your life. So being resilient, being passionate, being motivated, but at the same time, not being entitled and not let the competitive nature that you know, humans have uh, or animals have also to consume you. I think that's the biggest battle that uh, humans, humanity is always facing and scientists are also facing. So uh, for an aspiring scientist, I would say uh, be fearless, but don't be competitive. Uh, be uh, uh, enthusiastic, but don't let your ambitions to consume you. Uh, and definitely be okay with failures because that's, uh, uh, that's part of the course, that's part of the journey. And if you are not okay with failures, then you are not going to reach uh, the end in that journey. And I think being successful is not a singular process. It's a multidimensional process. It's a process in which you go through many, many failures and many, many realizations. So I will highlight, because the current education system uh, is based on this, you know, ranking and, you know, testing and figuring out who is the best of the best. But everyone is best in some ways and everyone will be able to uncover what their best potential is by, uh, you know, uh, not letting uh, these type of, you know, failure based or success based uh, things uh, prevent them to, f to uncovering who they really are. And so I'll give you an example as the last one. If I had let any of these obstacles or uh, 
success or failure based uh, evaluations get into me, I would have never ever left Samanda. I mean, it's very difficult to leave Samanda because it's beautiful to begin with, but it's also very difficult to chase your dreams in science in a small rural town like that because there is no science. I mean, I didn't have Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory in my, you know, like backyard. Uh, <laughs> I had a, like a very humble uh, high school that I went to and uh, uh, I had to learn that I could not let failures to stop me from where I want to go. And that's the biggest message I want to give to the high school students that are uh, going to, you know, uh, hopefully watch that video uh, that do not let uh, failures to stop you. Learn from them and try to move forward with your enthusiasm. And those sound like fantastic words to live by in any aspect of our lives, uh, including exactly. science. So I very much agree with that. Uh, so maybe finally we'll wrap up with um, what advice you might give to someone who's interested in pursuing research or even a general, you know, science focused career path, um, but they're not quite sure where to start. So I will definitely suggest asking questions. Questions are very important and without uh, settling to an answer, you know, uh, so you can ask a question like I can say, oh, what's a cell? You can go to a textbook and find an answer or you can you know, ask your teacher or you can go to Wikipedia or like you can ask online. And so you will get one layer of information. So that one layer of information may be enough for someone who is not gonna be a scientist. But if you are gonna be a scientist, you need to always ask more. And the, the, the reason that I'm uh, giving that advice because scientists can reach any information that's available to a human mind today. So, you know, any, any information in any textbook can be learned. Any information that's published out there can be understood and learned. And then as a scientist, you stand right at the edge of that human knowledge and ask a question that would advance the human knowledge, right? Like you, you ask the question right at the horizon where the human knowledge is struggling to find the truth and then you ask a question, you do an experiment to uncover the truth. And that's, you know, the most beautiful thing about science because you are advancing how much we know and you are making us closer and closer to what truth really is. It's like a truth seeker or truth finder uh, or a truth hunter. I don't know which uh, uh, phrase would describe it the best. Uh, but, but it all starts with a question and how you ask that question and how you are satisfied with the answer of that question. And that's what I teach students in my lab. You know, when I teach someone, I teach them to ask questions because they have a brain. They can find the information that I already found uh, or a textbook already has, but it's the ability to go from this, you know, like question asking to uh, information handling. So, uh, not every information also reflects the truth, right? So you need to critically evaluate the information that you get. And these hand in hand, the, the intellectual aptitude, the knowledge that you build uh, will feed the critical thinking. And with the critical thinking that you have, you will dissect the knowledge. And then at the, at the edge of the knowledge, of human knowledge, you will be like, okay, how can I cure cancer? Or how can I figure out, uh, you know, if you eat a hamburger, you are going to get cancer or not? You see my point? So there are certain things that we know, we have an intuition about, but at the, at the edge of human knowledge, we need to ask a question to advance ourselves. And, and that's what scientists do. And that's what I would recommend to any aspiring scientist to, to have. Keep asking questions and never be satisfied and do not wait the, the knowledge and information to be uh, spoon fed to you. So you need to work hard for it. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you. That's all the time we have for today. But thank you again, Samir, for joining us. I uh, really enjoyed having you for our premiere episode. Great. Um, if you at home enjoyed this interview, be on the lookout for future interviews with scientists and DNALC staff uh, on our DNALC Live homepage. So we'll see you next time. Thanks Great. again. Thank you, Sharon.